Good afternoon. Today we are announcing a superseding indictment charging 12 individuals in a conspiracy to illegally traffic over 90 guns across state lines into the city of Chicago. This case is an example of the collaborative approach the Justice Department is taking to protect our communities from violent crime and from the illegal gun trafficking that often drives it. This approach requires cooperation across all levels of government, federal, state, and local. And this case reflects that cooperation in the best possible way. On March 26 of last year, a mass shooting in my hometown of Chicago left seven people dead, wounded, and one person dead. Several of the guns that the Chicago Police Department recovered at the crime scene were traced by our experts at ATF's National Tracing Center. ATF found that five of the recovered guns were recently purchased from federally licensed firearms dealers located hundreds of miles away. Further investigation by our agents and law enforcement partners uncovered an alleged gun trafficking conspiracy involving over 90 guns and 12 defendants. Many of these guns have been linked to shootings in the Chicago area in which multiple people have been injured and several killed. In July 2021, a grand jury charged three enlisted members of the United States Army stationed at the Fort Campbell military installation in Clarksville, Tennessee, with crimes stemming from the purchase and transfer of dozens of firearms to the streets of Chicago. The superseding indictment that we are announcing today charges nine additional defendants in the conspiracies and other substantive offenses. The indictment alleges that the new defendants are members of the Gangster Disciples Street Gang in Chicago. They are alleged to have conspired to purchase and deliver over 90 firearms to the Chicago area to facilitate ongoing violent disputes between the Gangster Disciples from Pocket Town and rival gangs. In a moment, my colleagues will discuss the details of the case more specifically. The Justice Department recognizes that fighting violent crime requires approaches tailored to the needs of individual communities. But gun violence can be a problem that is too big for any one community, any one city, or any one agency to solve. That is why our approach to disrupting gun violence and keeping guns out of the hands of criminals rests on the kind of coordination that you see here today. That is why last year we established five cross-jurisdictional strike forces to disrupt, to disrupt the pipelines that flood our communities with illegal guns. These strike forces are designed to foster sustained coordination among federal, state, and local law enforcement partners across jurisdictions. They are set up to disrupt the entirety of illegal gun trafficking networks from the jurisdictions where guns are purchased to the places where they are used to commit violent crimes. But our efforts are not limited to strike forces. As we made clear in our guidance to all federal prosecutors and law enforcement agents last May, criminal gun traffickers who provide weapons to violent offenders are an enforcement priority across the nation. I also want to note that we can do even more to hold criminal gun traffickers accountable and to get more illegal guns off the streets if we have more resources. We need resources to trace the guns our state and local partners recover from crime scenes. We need resources to bring to justice those who perpetrate gun crimes. And we need resources to disrupt the criminal gun trafficking networks that fuel violent crime. That is why we have asked for, and the President's FY23 budget has requested, a substantial increase in funding for the Justice Department's anti-violent crime efforts. Gun deaths in our country occur at a staggering pace. Every day, on average, about 100 Americans are killed and hundreds more are wounded. And those numbers do not even begin to capture the number of families who are affected 
and the number of communities that are terrorized. If we are going to put an end to the enduring tragedy of gun violence, we are going to need more resources to do it. In closing, I want to thank the federal agents, prosecutors, and personnel who worked on this case. That includes members of the ATF, the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Division, the Internal Revenue Service CI, the U.S. Attorney's Offices for the Middle District of Tennessee, and the Northern District of Illinois. I also want to thank our invaluable local partners at the Chicago Police Department, the, the Clarksville Police Department, and the Davenport, Davenport Police Department. I want to make one point abundantly clear. The Justice Department will spare no resources to hold accountable criminal gun traffickers. There is no hiding place for those who flood our communities with illegal guns. It does not matter where you are or how far away you are. If you illegally traffic guns, we and our law enforcement partners nationwide will find you. And I'm going to turn it over to the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Attorney General Garland, for being here today to announce this very important case. Uh, my name is Mark Wildeson. I'm the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee. I must tell you that I'm awestruck by the efforts of the agencies represented here today and the emerging, emerging scientific methods being used by ATF to examine shell casings and to trace them from their point of origin through violent criminal acts and mass shootings to the actual shooters. The technology being employed by ATF should send shock waves through violent criminal organizations, people who buy, sell, and use illegal firearms in their criminal activity. Uh, I think we'll all have an opportunity after the press conference today to have an example of some of this amazing technology that ATF utilizes. We're here today to announce, uh, to make an announcement related to a long-running investigation out of my district, Middle District of Tennessee, and the resulting multi-agency enforcement action that occurred this week in the Northern District of Illinois relating to violent crime. Last May, my office charged three arm U.S. Army soldiers stationed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, with crimes related to the illegal purchase of dozens of guns and selling and transporting those guns to the streets of Chicago. Many of those firearms were found by the Chicago Police Department officers, including at the scene of a mass shooting on March 26th of last year. The firearms were traced by ATF to their point of origin. They were sold by federally licensed firearms dealers in Clarksville, Tennessee, and Southern Kentucky. Since that time, ATF Nashville, in conjunction with ATF Chicago and its other offices, with the invaluable assistance of some of the agencies represented here today, IRS Criminal Investigation, Army Criminal Investigation Division, um, U.S. Uh, Chicago Police Department, and the Clark Clarksville Police Department. Monday of this week, a federal grand jury sitting in Nashville returned a 21-count superseding indictment against 12 individuals including the three soldiers who were charged last year. And the, the charges re related to conspiracy to traffic illegal guns and other crimes. On Wednesday, these law enforcement agencies, led again by ATF Nashville, initiated a highly coordinated operation aimed at arresting these defendants. Of the nine new defendants charged this week, I'm pleased to say that six currently are in custody as of this time. The indictment alleges that between December of 2020 and April 2021, over 90 guns were illegally purchased in Tennessee and Kentucky and sold or otherwise transferred to the Pocket Town Gangster Disciples Street Gang in Chicago. The indictment describes in detail the conspiracies engaged in by these defendants, the methods, the methods they used, the networks they used to transfer the arms and money and deliver them into the hands of the gang members. I don't have to remind anybody here 
about the vast increase in violent crime over the last couple of years, specifically gun crime, that has affected every major city in the United States. My colleague, U.S. Attorney John Lausch of the Northern District, who will speak shortly, is all too familiar with the violent crime, and particularly gun crime, that has plagued Chicago, and he's working diligently with the Department of Justice to get the, to marshal the resources needed to address this. As the Attorney General said, the Department of Justice has designated reducing violent crime as its highest priority and devotes a vast amount of resources to that. Today's announcement of the enforcement action involving my district and the Northern District of Illinois is only one such example. This should also serve as a warning to people who purchase guns illegally, e even if you are acting as a straw buyer for somebody else. You should expect an enforcement action by my office, by another United States Attorney's office, by the ATF, and our local, state, and federal partners around the country. Bottom line, if you illegally purchase a gun, the Department of Justice will be there. Finally, I'd like to express my deep appreciation for the law enforcement agencies and prosecutors here today and those who could not be with us today, um, including Assistant United States Attorneys Katie Reisinger and Josh Kurtzman from my office, who have been up in Chicago this week working on this case. I couldn't be prouder of the work they do and the tremendous effort they put into this case. And collectively, you look forward to seeking justice for the people impacted by the crimes that these de defendants are alleged to have committed. And now I'd like to turn over the podium to Nashville ATF Special Agent in Charge, Mickey French. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives is the primary lead agency uh, of all federal law enforcement uh, agencies out there that investigates illegal firearms trafficking. ATF is on the front line uh, in the fight against violent crime, specifically illegal firearms trafficking and the supplying of firearms uh, that are used in violent crime to uh, gang members uh, criminal gangs, as well as drug trafficking organizations. In the past four years, ATF has seen an increase of over 30% in illegal firearms trafficking investigations nationwide. This fi uh, illegal firearms trafficking is what is fueling the violent crime in the cities that we live and work in every day. And quite frankly, it, be it presents a grave uh, threat to our public safety when we're out in our communities. ATF's highest priority is reducing violent crime. Operation Pocket Sweep shows that ATF, along with our state, local, and federal partners, have the ability to collaborate and utilize all of our resources to not only disrupt, but dismantle this firearms trafficking organization. The arrest in April of 21, as well as the arrests that were made this past week, are, as mentioned, are a result of a 21 count indictment charging 12 individuals uh, with federal firearms and money laundering violations. From December of 20 until April of 21, Adams, Brunson, Miller, who are the three enlisted soldiers in Tennessee, trafficked over 90 firearms to the Gangster Disciples Street Gang in Chicago. Many of those firearms were needlessly used in violent crime uh, acts in the streets of Chicago. The cornerstone of ATF's Operation Pocket Sweep uh, utilized a crime gun intelligence approach. We analyzed and utilized crime gun trace data to identify these three enlisted soldiers uh, which was the start of this particular investigation. ATF additionally leveraged technology by utilizing the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, or NIBIN. NIBIN is the only national network that allows the capture and comparison of ballistic evidence that is used to not only solve crime, but also prevent violent crime in our cities. And it's quite frankly, is a vital to any crime reduction strategy uh, in, the, in our cities and states. Over 30 firearms have been recovered in this investigation, 
all of which have been entered into NIBIN, and they have produced actual intelligence leading to the linking of multiple shootings in, the, in Chicago and the Northern District of Illinois. Illegal firearms trafficking is not a victimless crime, as, as we have seen with the, uh, the shootings that we've talked about. ATF will continue to use all of our resources. We're gonna strategically target and identify individuals that are trafficking firearms, that are so sources of supply of guns used by criminal gangs and drug trafficking organizations in the streets that are, that are wrecking havoc with some of the violence that's going on that we read about every day in our news. ATF doesn't do these kind of cases, and I don't do these kind of cases because we have a badge. We do them because we want to serve and protect all the citizens across the nation and, and, and reduce violent crime uh, to the best of our ability. And we collaborate and work with our state, local, and federal partners every day, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. I'll turn it over to the U.S. Attorney, Northern District of Illinois, Mr. Lauer. Good afternoon, thank you, Special Agent in Charge French. Um, I'd first like to commend and to thank my colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the middle of D District of Tennessee, led by U.S. Attorney Wildeson, um, for their outstanding work um, in seeking to bring to justice those individuals charged with illegally supplying firearms to gang members in Chicago and also to those Chicago Gangster Disciple gang members who are accused of obtaining those guns to further their criminal endeavors. Cases like this have a tremendous impact, not only on the defendants who are charged, but on gang members in Chicago and across the country. What they see is that they will be held accountable for their efforts to illegally obtain the guns that are used to fuel the senseless gang violence that plagues many of the cities in our country, including Chicago. This investigation also demonstrates to the people of Chicago and the people across the country that the Department of Justice and all of its components, all of the field offices of the ATF, all of the U.S. Attorney's offices, will work with each other and work tirelessly to keep guns out of the hands of those people who are prohibited from having them and who use them to commit those crimes. Finally, I'd like to give a special thanks not only to our law enforcement partners who you've heard about already, the federal partners, ATF, uh, IRS Criminal Investigations, uh, the United States Army Criminal Investigation Division, but also to our local partners across the country, including in Tennessee and Kentucky, and in particular, in my case, the Chicago Police Department. The Chicago Police Department recently established specialized gun investigation teams that are staffed with dozens of officers who work hand in hand with ATF um, in order to eradicate the illegal trafficking of firearms into the city of Chicago. We are very proud to call them our partners and we look forward to continuing our important work together. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the special agent in charge of the Chicago Field Division of ATF, Kristen Dettinio. Good afternoon, thank you U.S. Attorney Lausch. Investigation of illegal firearms trafficking is most effective when law enforcement entities and prosecutors work together. The success of this investigation is due to strong and effective partnerships, not only locally in Chicago, but nationwide. Strategy to impact violent crime in our communities must be comprehensive. This investigation is a prime example of leveraging technology and partnerships to do just that. The officers and agents of each agency you see here today work tirelessly to identify and disrupt the illegal trafficking scheme that resulted in the diversion of firearms in Tennessee. When firearms enter the illegal marketplace through means such as straw purchasing, unlicensed dealing, and illegal transfers, the result is too often needless violence. You heard about it already today, but on March 26, 2021, law enforcement recovered multiple firearms at the scene of a mass shooting in Chicago. Multiple people were shot and one was killed. Through the use of crime gun intelligence gleaned from tracing, five of the recovered guns were determined to have been purchased in the Clarksville, Tennessee area. ATF is the sole agency in the United States authorized to trace firearms for law enforcement. 
The ATF National Tracing Center is the only crime gun tracing facility in the country, completing over a half million traces of recovered firearms in 2021. We are committed to working with all of our partners, wherever the intelligence leads us, to bring those responsible for illegally trafficking firearms, unlawfully possessing firearms, and committing violence in our communities to justice. This is not just a job to us. It is a calling to make our communities safer, better, and stronger. Thank you. I will turn it over to my colleague, First Deputy Superintendent Eric Harder of the Chicago Police Department. Good afternoon, thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Attorney General, <coughs> U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, uh, U.S. Attorneys for Middle Tennessee, Mark Wellison, and John Laos from the Northern District of Illinois, as well as Special Agents in Charge of Nashville Field Office, Mickey French, and Kristen Decenio of Chicago Field Office. <coughs> I'd also like to thank Mayor Lori Lightfoot, uh, who has been unwavering in her support of Chicago Police Department's focused strategies around gun trafficking and removing guns from the streets of Chicago. As you know, the shooting that occurred March 26th of 2021 in Chicago that was thought to be a gang dispute turned out to uncover a interstate gun trafficking operation. And this operation and investigation followed and it speaks to the power of local and federal law enforcement collaboration across multi-jurisdictional, uh, multi-jurisdictions to investigate and prosecute gun trafficking. It is a proof that working together, we can make a difference. In Chicago, this operation has direct ties to some of our most pressing public safety concerns which revolve around guns and gangs. What this demonstrates is how the fight to stop gun trafficking and decrease violence is a national issue. While the work of fighting guns and gangs is important, it is only a piece of the larger collaborative effort that we must maintain. Chicago Police Department remains committed to seeing this work through. Our gang investigations division and gun investigations teams do vital work on the ground every day. Our officers on patrol, working a beat, are building relationships with residents and growing community trust. So far this year, Chicago police officers have recovered over 2,500 guns. Every gun taken off the streets is a potential deadly encounter, and it's also a potential life saved. Our officers are help, helping to hold offenders accountable and make Chicago safer. They are often working side by side with country, state, excuse me, county, state, and federal agencies, combining resources for more impactful investigations such as this. Officers across the country risk their lives every day in service to every community. The safety of every city today will reflect the safety of our country tomorrow, and that remains a call to action. Again, on behalf of Chicago Police Department, I thank everyone here with me today from law enforcement and our partners across the country and look forward to continuing our work together, protecting our communities. I'll turn it back over to U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, Attorney General Garland, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just first, you were talking about additional resources. I know the president announcing that he wanted to, or requesting rather, an additional $1.7 billion in his budget. Uh, what specifically um, does the DOJ want to see expanded? Could we see more of these tracing units that were used in this particular case? And also, what is your response to some community leaders that are uh, concerned about adding more resources when it comes to law enforcement in their communities? Yeah, so there's a long laundry list, actually, as you can, as you can imagine. Uh, having more ATF agents is very high on our list. Having more assistant U.S. attorneys very high on our list. Same is true for all of our other law enforcement agencies, FBI, DEA, U.S. Marshals. Um, all of these are necessary because it's really an integrated whole. Uh, similarly, we could use more grant money to give to cities like Chicago um, for purposes of uh, helping us with the task forces that are the most important uh, way in which we um, solve these crimes. Uh, everything has to be done on a state, local, federal level. People on the street, the cops on the beat, they know more about the origins of the crime in the local community than we could possibly know. So it's an all of country, really, effort, and it requires resources at all levels. 
Uh, Attorney General, the, um, the department in the announcement of the budget um, uh, in recent days talked about adding about, uh, I think, uh, over 100 ATF agents. One of the things that, uh, that appears to do is obviously keep pace with the number of retirements from that agency. It doesn't look like it really adds any more bodies. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering, you know, how do you expect to be able to make a dent uh, against this violence if, if you're, ba you know, you're barely keeping pace uh, with the retirements from that agency? And then secondly, uh, if you could take an off-topic question, um, uh, Federal Judge David O. Carter uh, had a ruling uh, in recent days in which he said uh, that the former president most likely committed crimes. Uh, have you read that ruling, and uh, does it make a difference in the work that the Justice Department is doing? So to take your off-topic question first, you know, we follow the facts and the law wherever they lead. Um, and uh, that's all I can say about the investigation. Uh, it's our longstanding norm um, to not comment on ongoing investigations. The best way to undermine an investigation is to say things out of court uh, about how they're going. So I'm going to leave that one aside. Um, I've, I've read reports in CNN on the ruling. <laughs> um, uh, now you're on top of question. So I, 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 I'm going to have to ask uh, for uh, somebody to get back to you on the details of whether the 100 only make up the number of people uh, who are retiring or not. I, I'm not sure why that would be the case, because if we had the FTEs before and we're asking for an additional 100, it's to add more FTEs, and then we would fill all the slots if you think 100 are leaving plus another 100. I just don't know enough details, but I'm going to ask Anthony to get back to you on that one. Mr. Wilderson, can I ask you a little bit about what you're alleging the crime here? Uh, these, the, the sales were illegal because they were straw purchases. Are you alleging that the Army men knew they were selling this to violent gangs? And what does it say about how the system works that these guys were able to buy 90 guns and straw purchases, but that was never discovered until the guns were used in crimes? So yes, we are alleging that they were straw purchasers and they knew that they were buying them for other people. Um, the lead defendant, Miller, um, when you read the superseding indictment, you'll, you'll see many, many examples of guns that were purchased by make, model, serial number, where they were purchased, along with the communications that the defendants had among themselves related to orders to be placed related to the transactions and how to pay them, how much they were going to be, the price of the purchase. So a absolutely. Uh, as to your other question, I'm going to have to defer to somebody else on that. I think I heard someone say that 30 guns from this uh, sting where this operation were recovered, I think that means 60 plus are still on the loose. Uh, what are efforts, what efforts are underway to find those guns and what does that say about the challenge of these investigations? They are very challenging investigations as you can see by all the agencies and the states that these guns have crossed. Um, all I can say to your first part of your question is our investigation is ongoing. Attorney General Garland, if you could comment, uh, we've been told that a lot of the crimes across the country are being committed by juveniles. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I don't have um, uh, more than anecdotal uh, information about that, but to be honest, I've heard the same. I was in uh, Colorado at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I was in the Middle District of Louisiana at the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, and I was in Atlanta in, uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office and talking to law enforcement, all the law enforcement agencies, state, federal, state, and local, in each of those jurisdictions uh, within the last three weeks. Uh, all of them said the same. Um, so I don't have any more than anecdotal evidence on that, but it seems that, that, that you're right about that. Did anybody theorize as to why it's happening? Yeah, I think the theory, uh, which is quite logical, is that uh, the gangs think that if they um, uh, have the actual purchases, uh, the actual um, shootings done by juveniles, uh, that they will face lesser punishment than if the actual leaders of the gangs themselves do it. Um, I think that's right. And also, of course, the leaders of the gangs don't want to face punishment. So they try to use a cutout of, uh, in this particular example that you're talking about, juveniles. Yeah, you want to bring us home? 
Yeah, if I could ask sort of a two-parter. Um, first one is, you know, this, this case is sort of interesting, but it doesn't seem to me it's probably representative of all the guns across the I'm country. I'm sorry, not representative? Uh, yeah, of all the guns across the country that are used in, in crime. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, you know, you could comment at all on why you think crime is increasing, you know, why we're seeing so many more gun trafficking investigations, guns used in crime. And my off-topic question is, it's been coming up on four months now since uh, Congress referred Mark Meadows to you guys for contempt of Congress, asking you to prosecute him. What's taking so long? Well, uh, uh, again, on your off-topic uh, con uh, conversation, we don't comment on um, uh, ongoing uh, referrals. There's, this was a referral. Um, and uh, so we're not able to comment on that. On the on topic, there are a lot of theories about what's caused uh, the rise in crime. Um, and I think we're just too close uh, to the event, just like uh, questions about earlier uh, spikes in crime. Um, um, actually, many of them are still uncertain as to why they, uh, they went up at the time. So I'm just gonna have to leave um, that for the criminologists and uh, we're gonna do the best we can uh, to drive those numbers down. I'm sorry to ask an off-topic question, but <laughs> there's been so much criticism of the Justice Department around the January 6th investigation, and a lot of people trying to pressure the department to either work faster or even to investigate specific individuals. How would you respond to that pressure and to those critics? Look, the only pressure I feel, and the only pressure that our line prosecutors feel, is to do the right thing. That means we follow the facts and the law wherever they may lead. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.